Well, everyone, welcome to our uh, second official roundtable. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Last time uh, we did this was the beginning of 2021, and the idea there was it was just a bunch of huge Billy Joel fans. And this time we decided to do something a little different. Uh, we went with a group of people that we know are Billy Joel fans, but are also fellow podcasters. We thought it'd be interesting to, you know, see where this intersects for everybody. Uh, it's also great. You know, I think we all have slightly different relationships with everybody here. So it's fun to have everyone in the same room, albeit virtually, to talk a little Billy and talk a little shop. And uh, we'll have fun and see where it goes. And today's guests are Stephanie Myers from Stephanie and Stephanie Talk Tunes. We have Bob Neville from Tales from the Corners and our friend Brian Colburn from a uh, brand new podcast, My Weekly Mixtape and Playlist Wars. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Let's do some introductions here. Um, if everyone wants to tell us uh, just a little bit about your podcast and how you got into podcasting. Um, you know, it occurs to me, we know a little bit about everybody, but I don't think we know everybody's backstory here. So I'll go clockwise looking at my screen. So Bob, you're up first. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my my podcast is called Tales from the Corners. It's based on a blog that I had been doing for years here in Peachtree Corners, Georgia, which is about 30 minutes north of Atlanta. And I started this because I was doing a lot of video production and I did a lot of video production for uh, CNN and CNN Airport Network. Been with them for many years. And I did a lot of music features uh, on various artists. One of them was Mike Del Judas. Did a package on him for CNN Airport Network. And I built a roster of uh, PR contacts. So when Airport Network folded and there wasn't much of an outlet for any of this, these ideas, I went ahead and started a podcast. And I was saying, hey, you know, I could give you an outlet as to uh, th all your clients can speak with me on my own format. And uh, it took off from there. Uh, we did it about three years ago, we started. And uh, started with a guy named John McCutcheon. He's a folk music artist. Somebody found me on LinkedIn, his PR person. So started with that. And I kind of caught the, the bug from that. And it went from there. And the second guest was Liberty DeVito. Met him years ago when I was doing some freelance writing. And uh, I was featuring him and Mark Rivera from Billy's Band. And uh, it was for a small alternative weekly newspaper called The Sunday Paper. And we have just kept in touch ever since. So Liberty was coming out with a book and he became my second guest. And from there, I just built up and all these PR people were writing me and saying, hey, can you get my client on? So we've been doing it ever since. I'm expanding beyond music this year. And getting a whole variety of different guests, uh, people who are leaders, creators, uh, writers, uh, it can run the whole gamut. So I'm, I'm expanding beyond that, but uh, music is definitely my first love. Uh, I really enjoy speaking with these artists about how, you know, what's the secret to their sauce? And we just go through that just about every week. Um, I'm coming up on 100 episodes uh, when I put these together, I really don't do a whole lot of editing. I'm a video editor producer by day. So I don't want to do more of this in my <laughs> spare time, if I'm, especially if I'm not getting paid. So, uh, if I do any editing, uh, I do it for the promos that, uh, show up on the different formats like LinkedIn and Instagram, Facebook, all the socials. Uh, so I'll do a little bit there. And then some of the episodes, I'll do a little bit of editing. If I have the time, I'll definitely put fonts on. For Liberty's episode, it is on YouTube. That was probably the most dressed up one and the one I had the most passion for because I had so much material and some people contributed some uh, photographs for me as well. So that was a lot of fun to do. Uh, I would love to get Liberty back again because he's a great interview, as you guys know. And uh, so, yeah, I, I really uh, look forward to expanding beyond 100 episodes. And uh, it's called TFTC with my name, Bob Neville. And, and you can find that uh, on most uh, platforms, uh, Apple Podcasts and whatnot. And uh, I don't get too caught up in the numbers and that just yet. I'm kind of just doing it for the passion. But uh, they're, they're starting to build, starting to get the downloads. And uh just basically speak with artists from all over the world. It's this, there's no limit. 
And uh, I really enjoy that. And some people I speak with are behind the scenes type of people like Rob Mounsey. And you guys mentioned him. He was on, uh, he's, uh, he worked on the nylon curtain and uh, did a lot of uh, arrangements on Scandinavian skies. And uh, it was a great discussion. I really enjoyed that. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And then meeting you guys, the Glass Houses guys, through those groups has just been fascinating. I, I really enjoy it. That's fantastic. Uh, thanks again. And, yeah, congrats on 100, first of all. That's a, that's a huge milestone. I know for Jack and I, we had no idea where ours was going to go either. I'm like, are we going to get sick of this and each other in two months? Or, you know, we, <laughs> we, you know, we tried to uh, create something that we could sustain early on. Uh, in the hopes that it was going to do well. And, um, you know, and you've got the right attitude, you know, doing it for you and your passion and, um, you know, let your audience find you. Yeah. It's a labor of love. Definitely. It's, I'd love to monetize this. I'm, I'll be interested in doing that more as, as time goes on, but I don't have any plans to, to quit doing this. I really enjoy this. I need this creative outlet because being a video editor producer, it really does help me for, for my daytime work, which is, Basically, with CNN Domestic, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, Wolf Blitzer's show, Jake Tapper's show. I do um, a lot of video work with the uh, producers and reporters. So uh, it, it does help me in my day job, and they're okay with it. I wish they would actually <laughs> buy my podcast, but uh, I'm not <laughs> expecting that. But I, I like the roster of podcasters who are affiliated with CNN, like uh, David Axelrod and I listen to a lot of that stuff. They're a huge inspiration. All right. And uh, Brian, you want to tell us a little about the, your podcast? Sure. Well, like Bob, I am a industry veteran. I actually started off in radio 20 something years ago and podcasting became something for me. I'd say probably around 2002 when the network that I worked for in New York City started posting some of our content to the web. And they didn't call it podcasting back then because there was no iPod. It was called webcasting or webisodes. And it was basically just taking the live radio broadcasts and transitioning them onto the web so people could listen at their leisure. From the network level, I actually went to a nationally syndicated radio program where I was uh, broadcast operations coordinator for that program for several years. And during that time, probably around 2004, 2005, I got my first iPod and I came home and brought it to my wife and I showed her the iPod and I said, hon, I said, I'm going to have her love and hate relationship with this device. And she <laughs> said, why? And I said, well, I'm going to love it because I can have all the music I want in one place all the time, but it's going to put me out of a job. <laughs> and I wasn't exactly correct, but around 2006, I actually made the transition into podcasting full time. And since 2006, I've been podcasting professionally for businesses and organizations and corporate media and podcasting for fun on the side since 2017. Because when you work with audio and video all day, why not come home and work with audio and video all night? <laughs> so in 2017, my buddy who actually lives in Atlanta right now, him and I started a podcast called Toon Styles, and that ran for a little over three years. And then in 2021 or 2020, I'm, I'm losing ever since COVID, I've lost track of what years happened from 2020 on. So some time in that time, my best friend and I started Playlist Wars, and we were just doing that as an excuse to get together and chat because we didn't really find time to hang out and talk music. And that show took off more than I would have ever expected. Unfortunately, family time and having two kids and him having two kids that are much younger than my two kids, we had to go on a hiatus because we just couldn't find the time that synced up for both of us to be able to do the show the way it needed to be done. So what I started doing this year, and it's actually launching this week, Michael and Jack, is a show called My Weekly Mixtape. And this is something that is a passion for me, which I think we'll talk about throughout the night. But making mixtapes is something I've been doing for at least three decades, probably four decades now. It's the way I was introduced to music. It was taking cassettes and recording my parents' records to them listening to the radio and trying to find the song where the DJ didn't talk over it and really trying to craft pieces of art 
if you want to call it that. These were snapshots in time. These were feelings I had based on a relationship I was in, or if I wanted to get psyched up for football or a workout tape, or if we're going on a road trip, every tape had a specific meaning to it. And the theme of this show is bringing on somebody else. Because when I was growing up, a lot of my friends and I would sit down, play our Nintendo showing my age again, Mm -hmm. and talk about what songs we wanted to listen to. And what we would do is we would record the songs onto a tape as we were playing video games and they became, I have boxes and boxes of mixtapes in my basement that I still every now and then drag out and put in just to remember what I was doing back in 1987. And this show is kind of a celebration of that because playlisting as much as playlist wars is a show playlisting feels a little less personal because when you sat down to make a mixtape, you were investing time and effort and energy into crafting this personal piece of art, if you want to call it that, because you would take you three to four hours to make a 90 minute tape. (laughs) Whereas now I could make a 20 hour playlist in about 30 seconds. So there's kind of a detachment with playlists. And I kind of want to go back and celebrate when discussing and really crafting what song's going to come up next meant something. And that's what my weekly mixtape is about. That's fantastic. Uh, and it's so great that you have so many of those cassettes still. I mean, what moments in time each of those are. Uh, and it's great that you can actually go back and relive um, some of those memories that I'm sure these tapes really help uh, conjure for you, you know? Definitely, definitely. That just reminded me of like when I used to make mixtapes too. I probably didn't make as many as you did, but it's also just the fact that you have to listen. Well, not have to, but you listen to each song as you're recording it too. So you go through the entire experience while making the mixtape too. Like, you know, you make a playlist, you just put them in a queue. I think that's another dimension to it. Definitely. When there were times as a kid that I would record a song from one cassette to the other, and then I would put the next song on and go, yeah, those two don't work together. And I would actually rewind (laughs) the tape and record something else. And it was, it was, I mean, probably they probably would have sent me to a doctor if I was doing that now, but back in the (laughs) eighties, this was just considered sitting and listening to music. Like it became, I can't put this song next to that one. That's a really sad song. And this is an extremely happy song and there's no flow. So we need to work our way from the sad song into the happy song with something in the (laughs) middle, a buffer, if you will. To kind of transition between the two. Yeah. Very similarly to a lot, how a lot of artists sequenced albums back then as well. Exactly. And that was my way to play radio DJ and play album sequencer, if you will. That was my chance to, at the time I wasn't writing and recording music. I was 10. So it was just me making my favorite artists tell a story that I wanted to hear through their music. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, uh, similarly in a way you, uh, you and uh, one of your very good friends have um, something very unique where you are finding songs that tie into the moments and memories in your friendship with your podcast. Can you tell us about what you're doing? Yeah, loving this mixtape talk. That has uh, been the crux of my life in so many ways. Um, but yes, I am Stephanie Myers. I'm one half of the podcast, Stephanie and Stephanie Talk Tunes. And I co-host that with my friend of 20 years, uh, Stephanie Pena and representing uh, the full podcast tonight. We uh, met in college and we're both big, long-time music nerds. Uh, by way of background, I'd spent some time doing music journalism and she was in concert production. And we have many, many music memories together over the years and in our friendship. Um, our angle is talking about the stories and memories that we connect with the music. That's kind of our tagline. So we focus on one song per episode We talk a little bit about the background of that song itself. And then we share the personal stories that we have um, connected to that music, including the band, including the song. And so those are usually shared and joint memories um, that span from our friendship. So we try to make it um, in a way, just a music slash storytelling hybrid show. And we've had a lot of fun doing it. We started in April, 2021, also in the, middle of the pandemic and it has been a really nice I think creative outlet for both of us we're really enjoying it and you know we'd always been told over the years uh, you guys have so many stories like you guys just have so many joint stories and we realized the podcast was just a great avenue for this and we had a lot of material and we hope to 
continue with that and hope to make more music memories together so that we can, you know, continue the show and make it interesting. Fantastic. Hey, what, um, what was your experience in music journalism? So I freelanced for a number of publications, um, Music Feeds, Diffuser. Um, I, um, way that we had tied that on recently was um, I'd interviewed Meatloaf uh, back in the day. Mm. And uh, after his passing, I realized I had the audio, which is essentially my audio notes, you know, from that episode and interviewing him. Yeah. So we interviewed that. Uh, we released that. And that was um, really nice. And as a longtime fan, it was like a cathartic moment for me too to uh, be able to just kind of have something to put out there in the world. Yeah, that's great. I have a couple from a few people I interviewed that uh, every so often you know, you go back and you listen to them again. And it's it's nice to have that, not only the memento, but you know, just, just to have that raw um, kind of unfiltered information coming out of them too. Yeah. Especially if you're a big totally. fan, you know, it's like it's something special that you have. That's really great. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a little treasure trove. Yeah. Better than <laughs> any autograph. Yeah, right. for sure. <laughs> for sure. And, and I found that most artists, you know, even in a professional setting, prefer a conversation over, Hey, can I take a selfie or can you sign a piece of paper? Um, you know, I think so many artists would much rather have a conversation with somebody than, um, uh, you know, just a very surface level interaction, like a, a selfie or something along those lines. Totally. Totally. I think yeah. they get a lot of that too. Just people coming up <laughs> like, Hey, it's ever a picture. <laughs> it's also fun. I think, uh, I have, I have a feeling a lot of people that interview these people, uh, don't have a lot of musical experience and they must be asking really rote questions because they get taken aback for a moment. They're like, Oh, Oh, we got a live one. Like I can actually yeah. relax and, and talk shop for a minute here. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's like, oh, it's a yeah. fan. Someone did their research. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Brian, I'm, I'm curious, what was the, uh, cause you were, you, uh, you, you must be one of the first adopters that if you were looking at this back before the, uh, the iPod came out, what was the, um, what was it like just everybody wrapping their head around the technology? Was, was were there a lot of like learning curves going on as this evolved or was it pretty straightforward? In the beginning, um, trying to find the proper compression for the MP3s because 128 was considered, and I hope I'm not talking too deep in the woods for people that list that aren't music nerds like myself, but the 128 MP3, which was, if we want to talk Napster, kind of the hmm. de facto format file. And as soon as I first heard it, I said, eh, this kind of sounds crappy, but heck, whatever. <laughs> this is this is where it's going. Okay. But with speech, you were able to kind of dump it down. So trying to find the proper format, because back in the early 2000s, a lot of people were still on dial up DSL. So people mm -hmm. were not downloading, certainly not 4K video like we are now, but we're talking three kilobytes and people would spend three hours at, at home waiting like in three hours, this song will be mine. You know, and yeah. that's something that's a lot different. But back then we had to kind of take note of that. Because if you uploaded this massive file, people would never get a chance to hear it. So it was kind of that adoption. And then the other adoption was the fact that the radio industry that I came from wasn't necessarily welcoming podcasting with open arms. They were kind of coming at it as a intruder or an enemy. And I went to a radio conference once and I was speaking about the fact that I was veering into more of podcasting. And I was told flat out by somebody who I truly respected in the industry that I was a traitor to the radio industry <laughs> and I was not staying true to the format. And I said, there's no reason why the two can't coexist. And if they don't coexist together, it's going to mean the death of one of them. And we don't want that. We want them to be able to coexist and expand the notion of what radio actually is, because mm -hmm. not everybody can listen at a specific time. And I think the beauty of podcasting is you're able to get the content you want when it's best for you, because at the end of the day, all we really have is time. And if you're in your car, if you're out for a walk, your favorite radio show might not be on the air at that time, but through the magic of podcasting, you could take that with you wherever you go and listen to it at your leisure, but still support the people that are on the air. So as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, the two need to coexist because I can't see a world and I don't ever want to see a world where radio is not a part of it. I, I'm not ready to give that up. And I understand that people kind of look at it as a dying medium. I don't believe that at all. I believe there's definitely a world 
where radio and podcasting can and should coexist together. So it was very challenging. And it was definitely back in 2006, a massive risk leaving a cushy, and I'm using quote marks for <laughs> the audio version, radio job to go into this new frontier, so you, so to speak. And I'm so glad in 2023 to be able to see that not only is it thriving, it's bigger than it's ever been, and radio is still alive. I won't say it's the same animal it was when I started 20 years ago, but it has changed and adapted to the times and has embraced podcasting finally. So the two mm -hmm. now can coexist together, which to me is a very, very important thing. I'm noticing that a lot of terrestrial radio now do have podcasting as a regular part of their ecosystem. So it's it's more common than not to have that be a compliment to their on-air shows. Yeah. You, know, you wonder if it's- Complement each other too, definitely. It's kind of happening here in Atlanta. They're bringing back a station that was called 99X, which it was you know geared oh, yeah. to the Xers. You know, that is making a comeback and people are really enjoying that. So these things can really coexist and complement, definitely. If they could cross promote, so it's, it's a great thing. But back in 06, it wasn't really ready for prime time. The, no. That uh, that iPod was just the very newest thing. And actually, I remember working on video podcasts. Uh, we did for uh, Robin Mead show, the uh, headline news back then. Uh, we used to actually do little segments. For, it, it just it was way ahead of its time. And we actually stopped doing that after maybe two or three years. It was just not ready at all. But the technology's changed. Now the smartphones are so much better. And now you got Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Music. You could easily download this stuff. So it, it's, it's the convenience. It's definitely better now. I'm curious, Stephanie, did you have um, a lot of AV experience before going in? I mean, you said you were, you know, coming from music journalism. It sounds like everybody else was it was at least doing some sort of editing before they were podcasting? Yeah, great question. Not really. Um, and that was uh, my learning curve. I uh, do edit the episodes between um, Stephanie Pena and I. Um, and it's kind of been a nice skill set to be able to carry into um, a little bit of my day job. I do digital communications. Um, mm -hmm. So being able to say, hey, now I can, I feel comfortable editing audio and then um, really kind of learning um, to edit video for our promos too, um, has been great. So I just feel like podcasting has helped me in so many different ways that I didn't expect. So it's really been nice. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a lot of the equipment now it's, it's easy enough to use, but you can't do it unless you put in the hours and if you have to have a project yeah. to do it on or, you, or you'll, you'll never do it. You'll never go through that motion. You gotta have the project. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately <laughs> a lot of people think because they have an iPhone, they're, mm -hmm skilled video editors because of TikTok and because of yeah. Instagram. And certainly I have seen content creators with zero video experience blowing my mind with some of the stuff they create, because at the end of the day, the creative eye is part of what becomes good video or good audio. So mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean the equipment, but kind of the <clears throat> thing that I'm always trying to push in the real world is that the equipment, when you know how to use it, could take what you're doing on an iPhone and elevate it and make it better. And you could tell the content creators online that are utilizing those tools and ones that aren't. And that's something where I think is a struggle for me as somebody who does this professionally and for fun to try to not blur <laughs> that line. Because at the end of the day, when I'm talking music with people, I am not producer, editor, Brian. I am... Yeah music nerd, Brian, and separating the two sometimes can be a challenge for me because it's what I do 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And then I go and do it for fun after work. Yeah. So it's kind of that blurring that line of the two. Well, I think that makes a, a great segue because uh, we definitely like getting in the weeds and I, I think we can talk tech <laughs> for the next two hours. But um, I think this is a good spot. Speaking about being music nerds, uh, let's let's talk a little Billy Joel for a minute and then we'll we'll get back to just the craft of podcasting. Uh, so, you know, we're all here not only because we're podcasters, but we're also uh, big Billy Joel fans. So uh, once again, let's go around. And um, I'm curious as to hear about uh, when everybody first discovered Billy Joel, what kind of caught them about him, you know, any memories, things like that. So uh, so starting with Bob, and I'm sure you've told us, you know, <laughs> off, off the record, but let's, let's put it on now. So um, when did you get into Billy Joel, Bob? 
Yeah. I think you probably read one of my emails online on one of yeah, your shows. I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Who doesn't? I mean, millions have their own stories with this artist. Mine oh. goes back to about when I was in fifth grade. So I'm I'm gonna probably give away my age here. Um the stranger had just come out and I have an older sister and she's seven years older and she came home with the album one day and I kind of knew about him cause just the way you are was already out. The, the single was out. I think she already had the single, but she got the whole album. And I was like, what's this all about? And when she wasn't around, I kept spinning it and spinning. It. I was like, I never listened to an album all the way through, but this really caught me just start to finish. And then she got the eight track. And that was really cool because we can play that in the car and I can sit there and put, you know, pictures to music. And it was just wonderful. But, you know, in the old Delco A track that actually <laughs> like we cut some songs in half. I think Italian restaurant was cut in half easily. <laughs> part one and then the next track part two. Yeah, it's like, like it interrupted the songs quite a bit. Yeah. You remember that? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, program one, two, three, four. So that's giving away my edge. But uh, then I remember the Saturday Night Live appearance uh, in early 78. Uh, I stayed up late with my sister watching it. And, uh, and I remember Chevy Chase saying, yeah, this guy's skipping his high school reunion. I was like, this guy's so cool. He just he doesn't even have to go to his high school reunion. And he's like, he's made it. And, you know, screw <laughs> that. So um, that which was my first. To, which is amazing to think how young he was then because it was his 10 year yeah. high school reunion. And he's right. you know, playing Saturday Night Live. And, you know, this is already album number, what, five for him, which is pretty wild to think. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know there were other, other albums before that until way later, until I was old enough to go to record stores. And I was like, what? I thought I had everything. What? There's something worth it. The Stranger. There, what, what's this? Uh, oh, my God. Streetlight Serenade. Piano Man. I didn't know all this. <laughs> I, I learned that years later. But um, I remember when she came home with 52nd Street. I think she got it the day after she saw him in concert. So she saw him in October of 78 in Toledo, Ohio. And wow. I think you guys were talking about that tour or something. And she saw him on that tour. Pretty sure that was released the day after that concert uh, that she saw him, I think Centennial Hall in Toledo. And uh remember getting that album and spinning it when she wasn't around. And I, I love Zanzibar. It was like, that was my introduction to jazz. I was like, this is so cool. I mean, like, you know, a pop artist can do this. It was beyond the singles. Just really been uh, through with him ever since. I remember she brought home Glass Houses, uh, just serious, true rock and roll. And from there, I was really hooked. I didn't see him live until I was about 17. It was uh, Innocent Man Tour, from Piano Man to an Innocent Man. And I was just like completely blown away. My seats were terrible. I joked with Liberty <laughs> about like, yeah, the first time I saw you, you know, by the time we got to my life, the second song, why does everybody want to get high? I mean, who's getting high to my life? You know, I'm just like, <laughs> what? I can see, you know, Pink Floyd, something like that you're getting high to, but like, really? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm a number of times over the years. Uh, it would be a little while. I missed him on the bridge tour then saw him on Stormfront. I remember when Stormfront Front was released. I was already here in, the, in Atlanta. And uh, I remember going down to Turtles Records and getting that on CD and thought, wow, is this guy really jumped the shark here? I mean, like, he's not <laughs> using Phil, Phil Ramone. He's like, guy from Foreigners co-producing. What's going on here? Uh, so I remember the popularity of that. Saw him in 1990, around July 4th. And uh, next time I saw him was Face to Face. Uh, also in Atlanta. Years later, I met Dave Rosenthal, who was Billy's music director. And he was telling me that they actually rehearsed the first face-to-face -to -face tour completely in Atlanta, the, the then Georgia Dome. Mm -hmm. And uh, just continue being a fan. I didn't see him like hundreds of times, but uh, as much as I could when he would come to town. And uh, just really been into it ever since. And a lot in the orbit. I, I've been very close to uh, Billy Joel's orbit. Uh his second wife had a show on CNN and I used to do what's called mastering it. And I think you guys were curious about this as an editor mm -hmm. back then uh, you'd have to take the pieces parts of a show and work with a crew to put it all onto one tape. And in these, those days it was called D2. It was a digital tape and she did a show called living in the nineties and lasted about six weeks. Uh, Christy was uh, then canceled, and she went on uh, Regis and Kathy Lee and was saying how 
wrong she was by the executives at CNN that her show was uh, let go after only about maybe six, seven weeks. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember Reed just quipping like, oh, they're such sweethearts. Uh, I can't believe they would do this to you. <laughs> so uh, that was my experience with Chrissy, but she did have um, Billy on one of the episodes. So I say I saved the tapes. I, I, I don't know if I sent you a still of that. I do have, it's only like five minutes of what they call leads where they're introducing the packages and the outros mm. and all that. I was like, I'm keeping this. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I, 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 I remember putting in the beta tape. It was called beta SP. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. He's, he's on the show. He was out in LA doing something and uh, she did uh, you know some leads with him. And he was really, really funny. But you could tell things weren't going so great at that time with them. And that was around 92. So he was kind of referencing that he was working on River of Dreams around that time. Sure. And uh, I missed that tour for some reason. I was getting busy in life, but I did see Face to Face. And then wouldn't see him again for a while. I saw him in 07 uh, and had really, really good seats to that show. I finally got to see him really up close. I was like in the seventh row for that show. And oh, nice. uh, that around that time is when I spoke with Mark. I did an interview with him. So I, I probably have the audio somewhere. I wish I could release that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark's a great interview. And uh, Mark Rivera, his sax player. And after that, um, saw him again in 2015. And then 2017, I did a package on Mike Del Judas. I thought that was a really interesting story of how he ended up in the band. And I went backstage. I saw Billy back there. Uh, looked like he didn't want to be bothered. Uh had a great interview with Mike, got to see the whole gang, uh, Crystal Taliferro, uh, Carl Fisher, met Tommy Burns, all those guys, Dave Rosenthal, great people. And it's a great crew because when you're backstage, you really see what a family that is and how they uh, really pull it together. Just serious pros. These guys are, are just amazing how they put these shows on. So that was a real, real treat. And saw Billy again in Boston almost two years ago. And then I just saw him very recently. I was telling you, Jack, I was mm-hmm. going through the set list as I was seeing Billy. He he appeared here in Atlanta with uh, Lionel Richie and Cheryl Crow. And that was a real one-off. So I was like, what's this all about? It was called ATL Fest. And I had a blast. You know, a lot of the, you know, we talk about this. The set lists have pretty, been pretty much the same. But uh, I finally got to hear a matter of trust live because I missed the bridge tour. So I was just like, I'm done for the night. I just got to hear something <laughs> that I hadn't heard live before. So there's always like one or two that I hadn't heard live before. So I, I, I just really get a thrill out of it every time. And, you know, I don't mind hearing Italian restaurant for the zillionth time. It's just the vibe, the way he works the room. He's just... Uh, an all-time great artist and uh sometimes he'll make those local references when he comes here to atlanta he plays a little bit of the james brown song Mm -hmm. and mentions some places he mentions a place called the uh, great southeast music hall where Mm -hmm. um a lot of greats had played there he talked about opening up for jimmy buffett there once and uh i just noticed that was used again in uh, the sid and nancy movie so the sex Uh pistols was played there so uh Just awesome. I, I really, I, I just, you know, love following Billy Joel and just you know, anything he does and, and watch watching you guys do your unwrappings of the re-releases and all of that. It's just in the passion. I, I just love all of that. I tell you that we we're very lucky with our timing because there was several years in the you know, early two thousands where there wasn't a whole lot going on in Billy Joel world. And it was kind of a dark, dark period and Billy wasn't doing well and all of this. And, uh, but now with, you know, the, they're not just reissuing the same old stuff. They're getting really interesting projects out there and doing a lot of really creative things with his back catalog and going into the archives that for us, it couldn't be better because we still get to celebrate his entire career, but they're slowly trickling out these really interesting projects that give us a lot to chew on for a while. And I, for one, am now morbidly curious about the Jimmy Buffett, Billy Joel Cobill. That is, I don't think you could get more opposite than those two. Yeah. <laughs> we were mentioning that on the Stormfront show, too. I'm like, Jimmy Buffett, <laughs> Billy Joel. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people uh, were at this place. And if you want to look it up online, the Great Southeast Music Hall, it's, it's yeah. a legendary place, which I believe was like in a strip mall that on a mm-hmm. road called Piedmont. And oh, Piedmont, yeah. Of all places, you know, it's, uh, I imagine having to see Billy back then. 
before all of this. It was it must have yeah. been like maybe 73, 74 around there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it had to have been because around that time is when he flipped from being an opener, even though he didn't have the audience yet, he said he made a pretty conscious decision that I'd rather play my own shows to a small crowd than get eaten alive in an arena where nobody cares who I am. So it was probably around that time. Yeah. It had to be tough to be an opening act. Yeah. You hear yeah. these horror stories about it and like comedians even talking about being <laughs> opening acts for music acts. I <laughs> like these people want to eat me alive. <laughs> I worked with a band um, who was, did well in the nineties called the Verve pipe. And they, they did three months with kiss in 1996. <laughs> I guess Gene and Peter were big, uh, not Peter. It was a, uh, Gene and Paul were fans of the band, loved their record that had come out and invited them on the tour, which to them was an honor. But they said this was some of the hardest shows they've ever done. They said, you know, and a lot of it was Europe. They said, you know, we're dodging beer bottles, spit. They're like our bass player's bass is covered in spit by the end of the night, (laughs) people spitting on stage. And they said it was, you know, any songs that were a hint of a ballad in their normal set out the door and they played their most rocking stuff they could just to survive. But they, uh, they said they, uh, <laughs> they really had to work hard to get through that one. That is quite the bill, Michael. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we have two dream concerts to go to. <laughs> just oh, wow. to see how it goes down. The year of her pipe learns how to play smoking in the boys room just to get off stage <laughs> safely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. They said they, they were just yeah. about to launch the freshman, but they're like, we'll get eaten alive if we attempt to play the freshman at a kiss show. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, that was the only time in their career they never played it. I was going to say they should have just rocked it out and kind of reimagined it for those shows. That would have been pretty cool. <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> they were some great bootlegs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going in another order. Uh, Stephanie, how about you? What are your, I guess, earliest memories of Billy Joel? Yeah, hard to top all those. I'll just say straight up. But uh, I have been a fan since childhood, really. My parents played him a lot. And he's the soundtrack to a lot of my childhood memories in the 80s. And I always just think of the great 80s music videos. I think Uptown Girl was one of the first music videos I remember seeing from anybody at all. It was Mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, like somebody's, you know, didn't have the words uh, then to understand. It's like somebody's doing something different with the medium, but I knew I was seeing something really cool. Um, so he's a soundtrack to a lot of my memories. Um, Stormfront is uh, the album that I bought, I think, first with my own money. And I have really distinct memories of going to buy that as a kid and getting really excited um, and hearing those songs, even in the roller rink. Uh, it was such mm-hmm. a big deal. Uh, to be able to hear Billy wherever I went. Um, And, you know, I think too about uh, just the memories I connect with the music, just like we do on our podcast. But, you know, I think about how moving out, I've played probably every moving day of my life, you know, how that (laughs) just like seamlessly um, Mm -hmm. connects with so many parts of my life. And then New York State of Mind has a special place in my heart, um, having lived in New York for many years um, before moving out here to California. So um, really cool um, to be able to see him play that too. I've seen him in concert twice um, in 1999 in Houston, um, which was great. And then in Madison Square Garden um, in 2006 during his residency. So that was- Oh, you got to see one of the 12 Gardens shows. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a fantastic New York memory. Um, You know, and it just- Think about, uh, you know, Bob, you're talking about how he works a room. And that's what I always think about with him, because not everybody can play arenas well, but he knows how to play to the last row. And I really appreciate that about him. Not everybody can do it. Everybody can do it. (laughs) You say, yeah, Billy was actually my first arena show. So like that, that set a high bar because I saw him in Nassau Nassau Coliseum and uh, uh, he was just joking around like he was in a club. You know, yeah, just a total <laughs> command. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Billy <laughs> also started becoming <laughs> conscious about leveling up to the big venues like that because um, that's a big part of why Glass Houses sounds like it does. He's like, I want it to be five guys in a room, yeah, who play like really stripped down, tight rock and roll. That's gonna sound good in a big place. Yep. So he was very conscious about the kind of places he was playing and started writing for the live show. 
It's so great. It's so yeah. great. And that's why he's that's one of the why that album is so represented when he plays live. Yep. Yeah. 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 All right. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brian, uh, how did you come online with Billy? Well, similar to Stephanie growing up in the eighties, my first memories of music involve pretty much five albums growing up. My parents would take out their vinyl and it, I just have vivid, vivid memories of five albums. The Cars, Self-Titled, which is my favorite album of all time. Mm-hmm. Huey Lewis in the News, Sports. Yep. Pat Benatar, Precious Time. The Muppet Movie soundtrack. Paul Williams, one of my favorite movies of all time, especially, again, I'm two, three, four yeah. years old. And yeah, Billy yeah. Joel's Glass Houses. Those albums at the time, when I was growing up, my parents had an 8-track player in their car. And the first mixtapes I made were actually with my father, who would take the records and record songs from each record onto an 8-track that we would then bring into the car. And a lot wow. of the songs came from those albums and from Glass Houses. My favorite song from Glass Houses was always sometimes a fantasy to the point that I actually got in trouble at five years old for picking up my parents' phone, putting the needle down on the record and trying to figure out what numbers he was hitting <laughs> at the beginning of the song. And I think I had dialed 474-465-1235 happened to be the numbers that I thought it was as a kid. And to this day, yeah. I still think it is, but <laughs> I'm probably wrong. So that is how I started with Billy Joel. And then when I was around nine or 10, my parents went out to their friend's house and brought me along. All the parents, or there was no kids there. It was just me. And it was all my parents and their friends. And I'm just sitting in the living room, just kind of twiddling my thumbs. And they lived right down the hill from a Kmart. My dad said, you got your Walkman in the car, right? I said, yeah. He goes, come with me. I'll take you for a ride and I'll get you a cassette. So at least you have some you know, music to listen to. So he brought me down and I got Greatest Hits Volume 1 and 2 on cassette. And I started realizing that Billy Joel had other music besides Glass Houses. And I fell in love with all of it. And then as I got older, I kept going to record stores and trying to find cassette and then transition into CDs. And then I actually would go to some stores that still had vinyl in the late Mm -hmm. 80s, early 90s. And that's when I stumbled across this weird looking album with these two Vikings on the cover called Attila. And it said Billy Joel's earliest recordings. And I'm like, what is this? I love Billy Joel. So I grabbed it, brought it home and said, what is this? This isn't (laughs) Billy Joel. And then, you know, at the time there was no internet to look this stuff up, but it was just this strange album that I own that I was so blown away by kind of the weirdness and psychedelicness of it. And I followed him for years. I've seen him about 10 times. And I'd say, Stephanie, I probably sat right next to you because I was at one of the 12 garden shows and very cool the night i went this was my fifth time seeing him and i had always waited for one of my favorite songs to be played and he never played it and finally on this snowy night in new york city where we slid all the way through the lincoln tunnel trying to get just get parked to get to the show he finally played captain jack live And I Mm. honestly believe in my heart of hearts, if you listen to the 12 Garden CD, you hear me screaming, yes, it's happening, as he started playing it, because I was so (laughs) excited to finally hear that song. Kind of the way Bob mentioned when he, there's always that one nugget in the set. And finally getting a Captain Jack, I've seen him several times since, hasn't played it since when I was there. So I'm so glad to have that one moment in history where I got to see Captain Jack live, because it's kind of a darker song. And right. it, it, it's really dark. And my band, Colburn and Company, sometimes pulls it out in a set list and people will go, wow, that's a bold Billy Joel choice. And I said, but you know what? It's such a, an amazing, it's Billy Joel telling stories and you feel it. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful song that is a sad story, but the music is so soaring. It kind of makes it feel less sad. And that Mm -hmm. was always something that impressed me. And I mean, look, back when I was much, much younger, before I knew what Captain Jack was about, I just assumed it was Jack Daniels. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, 15, 16 years old. But obviously, time has taught me what the song is actually about. Regardless, um, being able to see Billy Joel in concert to me has always been a memorable, wonderful experience. Uh, My daughter's godfather and I went in college and our we actually told our teacher at the beginning of one of our broadcasting classes, we said, look, the class starts at five, but is there any chance we can cut out at six o'clock? Because they were very strict with leaving class early. What's going mm-hmm. on? We got tickets to see Billy Joel at the IZOD Center, and we don't want to miss 
this I don't think it was even called the IZOD Center. It might have been Continental Airlines Arena at the time, back in the late 90s. This was like 99. And he goes, how about this? I love Billy Joel. You're banned from class. Get out. Go. Enjoy the experience. <laughs> and That's believe awesome. it or not, our, our professor, who is somebody I'm still very, very close with at Montclair, he plays piano. And uh, at the every year they would do a Christmas party for our department and he would always start playing piano and I'd be like, play some Billy Joel. And he would start playing New York state of mind. And he'd be like, you better start singing. I know you sing. So I would always do New York state of mind with him. And before I go rambling too much here, because we're just kind of gushing on Billy Joel, one of the most Welcome beautiful moments. Life. of Yeah. <laughs> one of the most beautiful <laughs> moments of my life actually happened in December of 2001. I was working in New York city and radio at the time. We're several months out of September 11th, and my buddy, the co-host of Toon Styles, and I worked together at the network in, in New York. And after our shift ended at midnight, we said, dude, there's a karaoke bar down the street. Let's, let's go down and sing a few tunes and relax for an hour before we call it a night. And mm -hmm. we went over there, and we each put in our songs, and I put in New York State of Mind, and I started singing the first line, and I literally started crying. I had to stop because... It hit me what I what song I picked in my mind. I was going back to college, but after 9-11, that song just mm, right. hit me and the guy restarted it again. And by the end of the song, everybody in the bar was singing it all, like together. And it was just this transcendent moment that Billy's yeah. music gave us. And we always talk about that night. That was like the night that New York state of mind. Billy could have been in the room and nobody would have noticed because everybody was just like in this moment. And I yeah. didn't pick the song for any reason other than it was just one of my go-to karaoke songs. No way did I ever think that I didn't put two and two together until the, until I started singing the words. And it's just one of those moments I'll never forget. And it's an attachment to a Billy Joel song that just always holds a special place to my heart. So when we saw him in 2006 and he played it, I welled up like a baby when every time he plays it. I get that lump in my throat because it brings me sure. right back to that New York City bar, December of 2001 in that in that just that moment. And I I text my buddy when the song comes on, be like, hey, Jay, New York state of mind, man, dot, dot, dot. That's all I have to say to him. And he knows exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yeah, both that song and Miami 2017 took oh. on a whole new life after that. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. they yeah, it was those two became songs that they just played pretty consistently there on out because they just. Took, took on such a special meeting with so many people that, you know, he never would have imagined. Yeah. Miami 2017 is still one my, my band plays at every single show. And yeah. that mm. is one of the second set later part of the night songs, because as soon as our keyboard player goes into it, everybody's like, yes, because Miami 2017 isn't your typical cover band Billy Joel song. Right. It's usually right. and I'm and I'm just talking from bands I've been in cover bands I've seen on the New Jersey scene. Usually you may be right, but to go into Miami 2017, it, it usually garnishes a response from the people. That's a little more. Wow. And then Captain Jack gets the, wow, you guys are nerds. Like you're going deep into the catalog, <laughs> which I'm fine with that because that's a great first set just to kind of get warmed up to him because it's, it's, it's yeah. a really nice back and forth that lets the band kind of get locked in or violin player kind of gets the feel for the night and it all kind of comes together. So <laughs> yeah, the Billy's music is, is always been a special place in my heart and sorry for completely going on like 17 different tangents there. I, I have a problem and I'll, I'll work on that in the future. I promise. <laughs> well, that this We're is why podcasts. Jack and I That's do a lot job. of editing. <laughs> yeah. This is why Jack and I do a lot of editing. No, not for you, but for us. Oh, I was yeah. going to say, uh, you should hear the tangents that end up on yeah, that the horse shit. editing room floor. You know, <laughs> we'll go By the time this and, airs, it's going to be like, so Brian, tell us about your early memories. I listened to him on record. Okay, moving I on. I like Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> We're going to cut like one word from each sentence and have you say something ridiculous. <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> you know, uh, back in way up uh, in your stories, I was uh, Christmas shopping and uh, my, my daughter has a record player now, so I had to go to a record store. I didn't want to go to because it, it's big, but it's expensive, but they had a lot of new stuff. And, you know, you're not supposed to be shopping for yourself anyway, and I'm dropping, like, way too much money, like, totally paying the idiot tax for not looking around earlier and, and having to pay extra to, to pick it up off the shelves. And I look up, and I, I had to pull the phone, pull, pull it up to make sure I remembered it right. They had Attila, on, you know, up for sale, 150 bucks. 
And I'm like, this is like the Stratocaster in Wayne's world. Like, I'm just going to keep going back. Like, you will be mine. Oh, yes, you will be mine. (laughs) Now, the copy I had, unfortunately, I don't have it anymore. And it breaks my heart because, again, I'm going back to 12, 13 years old. And at one point, some of the vinyl just didn't make the move with me and it's no longer around. But it actually it was a re-release because it had a, a, a yellow like star on the cover. Yeah. Right. So it was right. like a re So you might actually have it, Michael. It was a re-release of the album. I do have that one as well. Yeah. And it's but definitely. Yeah, so this is the cover, Stephanie. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, very cool. So yeah, maybe very not Viking, cool. but it's definitely a, a, an interesting yeah. release. That's awesome. Yeah. They're basically Fabulous. wearing like chain mail and like armor and they're standing in a meat locker. It's awesome. Every and single then, way. Yeah. Right. I'm on the back. <laughs> great incredible that some- you have a copy it's wonderful I-, I would sometimes put that on for my friends and be like i'll give you you know at the time i didn't have it because i was in like eighth grade high school I'm like i'll give you a hundred dollars if you could tell me who this is and nobody <laughs> knew and when i would yeah. say it they would think i was lying they're like you're full of it i'm like no really it's billy joel and then i would have to show them the album yeah. cover and be like look it's him <laughs> I, uh, it's got I a, a lot of like of it deep purple very like kind of proggy kind of you know, early seventies metal. But what's wild is like 10 months later was cold spring Harbor. And that's, she's got away. Everybody loves you now. Like he did a complete 180 within like six yeah. months. And then you, you know. look back to the hassles before that. It was even like, he kind of had some progression before he got to who he was as a songwriter. But I have to believe in my heart of hearts, the beauty in songs like Zanzibar that Bob talked about earlier I think that came from the fact that he had such a well-rounded musical education in life that he was able to kind of branch out and do these things that were not typical to the, I don't want to call it pop rock as an insult, but at the time, right. Billy Joel mm-hmm. was considered pop rock, not pop yeah. so much more leaning rock, but he was definitely mm-hmm. considered a pop artist at one point, especially when right. he was the MTV darling that he was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. Mm-hmm. And was that a funny story about Zanzibar real quick? Doug Stegmeyer, the bass player, was didn't think he could do it. He was like telling Billy, telling Phil Ramone, the producer, he's like, this is I'm not a jazz guy. He's like, this is way above my my comfort zone. And Phil Ramone was pretty much like, no, 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 you're going to do it. Trust me, you're going to do it. And got finally got him convinced that he could give it a try. And so the story goes, once they finally did it, Doug's like, wow, I feel like a real musician now. (laughs) (laughs) I pulled it off. Yeah. Somebody yeah. put a, a video up on YouTube. They played the, the Freddie Hubbard solo at, at half speed. And I've been showing that to people, uh, like with some of my drum students and stuff. I'm like, you know, if, if you ever think like they're just playing random notes, it's amazing when you hear that solo slow to half speed and you realize like, no, these are full formed melodies just played mm-hmm. at warp speed. Like he's not just stabbing at it and staying in key. You know, there's a lot of thought. Into yeah. It. And Liberty once told me, he's like, you know, I mean, it's live. It's one take. It's not like we were stitching sections together. He's like, actually, if you listen closely between the the kind of more rocky groove and the jazz stuff, if you listen closely, you can hear me set my six down on my floor tom and pick up brushes. It's very quiet, but you can hear it. And then I throw them down, the brushes down when we go back into it. He's like, it's all one take, Yeah, which is unheard of now. Yeah, right. I have been stitched together. Uh... And they would have digitally removed the, well, uh, the stick drop. <laughs> yeah. The pro tools joke with making albums is like, you know, artists for this is a take and engineers like, all right, that sucked. Come on in. <laughs> like, we'll fix it. <laughs> yeah. I have a, I have a tape of, um, Attila in, in the car. Cause I have it. My, I have like a, I bought like an Oh three, two years ago. I'm like, I'm going for it, man. It had like 60,000 miles. So it had tape, tape player. So I dug out the tapes and one of them is Attila. I did the same thing to my cousin. I was like, I guess who this is. And it took him a minute. He's like, oh man, I've heard about this album. So he borrows the van and he listens to it. He goes, you know, I feel like this would go over now. He said, I think back then he would have been just another guy doing like kind of deep purple blues, rock freak out kind of stuff. And he, he kind of put the bug in my head a couple of days ago. I got to find the guy that can do it. He's like, I'm so he said, I'm surprised nobody's covered that album now. And like, just put out like a reimagining of it. How beautiful oh, yeah. would it be if he just opens a garden show with something off Attila? Yeah, it just comes How many flying minds would Woman. be blown? Like, it would just be like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is seven, but yeah. 
<laughs> he's too <laughs> he's four so, of them are on here now <laughs> yeah exactly he he really has a hard time like he's very sensitive to, to audience reaction so i know he would definitely never entertain it even though i think it would be great he'll yeah. he'll try something once and if it doesn't go over great he gets shell shocked and he's like oh that's the last time i'm gonna do that for 25 years <laughs> well what's funny is my my uh my daughter's godfather and I, we went to see one of the garden shows on this last 90 something show run. And every time our friends would post on Facebook, they'd be like, look, Joe Elliott came out. Brian Johnson came out. Paul mm. McCartney came out. So we're there all night going like, oh, somebody big is going to come out. Like, we can't wait to see who the special guest is. And zero disrespect because they did an amazing rendition of the song, but they brought out Chainsaw and did oh, Chainsaw. Highway to Hell. His roadie. Right, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, what? We, we got chainsaw? So the running <laughs> joke between my daughter's godfather and I for the last seven years has been, we got chainsawed. Yeah, because if like we're expecting something, like we're expecting right. Paul McCartney, ACDC, yeah. Def Leppard. And we got right. it. And he's like, well, tonight yeah. I'm bringing out a very special guest. And we're like, and, and, and it's <laughs> chainsaw. And we're like, who? You know, we didn't know we, th we we were expecting somebody and then he came out i'm like oh my funny. god but then when they did highway to hell i'm like this guy really nailed it like he deserved to be out there this was awesome and we mm -hmm. loved it but it wasn't paul mccartney so yeah. right <laughs> i felt that way in 2017 i saw him at then sun trust field and he said oh we're gonna have a special guest i'm like finally you know i wanted a special guest chainsaw comes out third time i saw chainsaw <laughs> yeah. does great but i, I oh, didn't yeah. want chainsaw Oh, that night. Mm -hmm. Right. I know. That sounds awful. No disrespect. You guys got to get Chainsaw on the show. <laughs> oh, yeah. We yeah. Actually, I, I know his wife. I I think we should definitely try to see if he'll uh, come on one of these days. Um, apparently, we should really hype it up. We should be like, all right, guys, we got it. This is <laughs> the, we, the, we, we, we captured the gold ring, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've seen him do that a few times and you know, they would do it cuz one the crowd would go crazy as you guys saw, but it would also give Billy like a 5 minute vocal rest which yep, he yep. desperately needed. Um I'm trying to think I've gotten a few I think I got Kevin Spacey as the special guest at a show. <laughs> um I think yeah, he sang New York well. State of Mind with Billy and I saw a Tampa show and we had we got Highway to Hell, but we got Cliff Williams and Brian Johnson. Yeah, I, I saw that footage on YouTube. That was yeah. like, oh, yeah, oh, very jealous. ACDC is is just one of those bands for me. I mean, as a yeah. kid, who it's yeah. just and they, this show was around two thousand. This was actually a different time they did it. This was like two thousand one. I want to say. Oh wait, so this wasn't on the. I'm sorry, I apologize. I've oh seen no, the this was in run Florida with... like twenty years ago. Yeah, okay, they did I apologize as well. And so they. Uh, I was working with Liberty at the time and he, I remember him saying, he's like, after we were talking, he's like, did you recognize anyone backstage? I'm like, just the band people that I recognize. He's like, Oh, well, we got something really cool happening tonight. I'm like, Oh, okay. And I decided to not, I was there by myself and I decided to see if I could get away with not going to my seat. So I kind of stayed to myself and hung out near the teleprompter operator. It was either that or the monitor guy. I forget who it was, but, uh, Standing there watching the show, and I felt somebody, you know, you feel if somebody is kind of coming up behind you. I could feel somebody walking up to me and watching the show, didn't think anything of it. And I looked to my left, and it's Brian Johnson standing almost shoulder to shoulder by this time. I'm like, wait, is that? And he had the, the hat, the whole nine. And I said, how you doing? He's like, I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, man, how you doing? You know, his, <laughs> his, his little gruff voice. And <laughs> and we we said hi and nodded. And we watched like Allentown. And then uh, he's like, well, good to meet you. And he walked away and then up onto the stage. And I was like, oh, this was the guest. But uh, yeah, <laughs> wow. it was wild. No, Watching a Billy Joel memory. song with him. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Did you ever hear uh, Jim Brewer recount when he was the special guest? And he's, oh, yeah. he's just backstage losing it anyway. And then Billy's hyping it up. You know, it's like, we have a very special guest. And everybody in the audience is like, oh, my God, it's going to be Bono. And Jim's like, they are going to be so disappointed when I walk out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because Jack and I, we saw each other back in August when we went to the screening of the Yankee Stadium movie on Long Island. And we were talking with Crystal Taliaferro. And 
she knows that Liberty and I are friends and, she, and she's like, hey, I'm going to see Lib in t- a couple of days. Well, it just so happened that a couple of days was a Madison Square Garden show. I was like, are they going to bring him out? Like, should we stay in town? Should we go get I'm like, tickets? Should <laughs> I stay, extend my trip? I'm like, should I? And I'm like, ah, I thought better. I'm like, now nah, I got to get on to Michigan for this work thing. And, and it turned out the guest was Olivia Rodrigo. It wasn't Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal was doing a recording set. Uh, no, she was playing a surprise party. birthday party that week with Liberty. Um, so that's how they were seeing each other. But yeah, I would have kicked myself if I happened to miss the reunion on stage. Yeah. Can I just go on record saying I really hope it happens at some point? I, I, I hope I speak for everybody when I say that. I, I, I had the good fortune on Playlist Wars. We had Liberty on to do a playlist and album, and we did songs from the attic. And the stories he told, I know Stephanie earlier mentioned Meatloaf. He talked about recording with Meatloaf and what a perfectionist he was in the studio and how meticulous he was. And yeah. hearing hearing Liberty's passion come out in that show, as you could see tonight, I do love to talk. But in that episode, I was just like, so I picked this song. Tell us about it. Like, yeah. I didn't want to <laughs> I didn't want to take up any time. I just wanted to hear him speak because I was just so blown away. One of my favorite Billy Joel albums is actually a live album. It's the concert album from Russia. Mm -hmm. And that version of Angry Young Man in the beginning, it is just, I feel the drums in my chest every time just he's playing them with such vigor and it's just, it's an assault. And the pacing he brought on that album had so much energy. Every song felt like it was just amplified from the studio version to a different place. Same thing with songs from the attic. And that's why they did to me concert was for the glass houses, 52nd street, um, Mm -hmm. innocent man, nylon curtain albums as songs from the attic was to piano man, cold spring Harbor and street life serenade. I really felt like it was the live album that took the studio songs and kicked them up a notch for the live Mm -hmm. show. And that's why basically songs from the attic and concert are, whatever the million different versions that you see written out are mm-hmm. my two favorite Billy Joel albums and they're live, which is really odd because I'm not normally a concert album person, but those two are just prime examples of live albums done just perfection. Yeah. yeah and that points to how good just they, and that's why they always tried to, to keep the records as live as possible because Billy preferred the live setting and he had such a great band. It was like lightning in a bottle back then. Mm-hmm. And they their their live energy was just unmatched. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's why we're we're hoping we we know that there's more shows from those eras that have been recorded. Um, we're we're kind of nudging <laughs> them to be like, yeah, there's a market for some of this stuff. Keep keep yeah. digging. Come on. Do you guys remember HBO growing up? There used to be a, a live from Long Island special they would play. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. What? Why has it that ever? Been? I remember vividly watching it as a kid, and I loved it. I don't, I don't know if it exists on VHS or I've never been able to find it. But I loved seeing that special when it aired on uh, HBO growing up. Yep, yeah, so it, Betamax. Yeah, so it, it exists on VHS, Betamax, and Laserdisc. Um, oh, there's a Laserdisc of it. Wow, I've got one behind me. Are you surprised? <laughs> I need help. Oh. I don't own a Laserdisc player, but I've got it. <laughs> um yeah so we because that's always been my favorite billy joel filmed concert ever and when we had steve cohen and john small on our on the podcast last summer uh steve has been billy's lighting director since 1974 and john small was the other guy in attila that i that you saw Mm -hmm. and he made a pivot from being in a band with billy to directing so many of billy's videos and uh and uh, Billy uh, married his wife in the meantime. <laughs> so they've got a, quite a relationship <laughs> over the years. Uh, but we asked them about Live from Long Island specifically. And um, this was prior to the Yankee Stadium release. And their hope was if Yankee Stadium did well, this was going to be one of the next ones on deck. Fingers crossed. And they that's confirmed a, that a... they, they've got the whole thing. Like with Yankee, they only filmed 13 songs. Um, Live from Long Island was done on videotape. So it's obviously much cheaper. Um, quality obviously is much different, but they said they've got all six or seven cameras, the entire show. It's all there. So they're, uh, they're, they're hoping it's coming. Yeah. There's oh, a video wow. out of 
I really appreciate that and how they're going to go back to those masters and mm -hmm. really remaster those kind of like what they've done with Beatle albums. I mean, they're going to take right. live from Long Island and really make that spectacular. So hopefully, yeah, they could maybe even transfer that to a theatrical release. So you might want to yeah. run back up yeah. to Sat Herber one day. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I made the uh, recommendation. I'm sure they've got their own decisions made up, but the original Live from Long Island was mixed by Jim Boyer, who mixed all the studio albums. Um, so that's why that one sounds especially good. And he he did songs in the attic as well. Um, but Brad Lee, who who's pretty much the the only engineer still alive who worked under Phil Ramone and Jim Boyer, uh, him and Larry Frank. But uh, Brad Lee is a mixing engineer as well. He's the one guy who has. Like as Jack, I think you said like the rightful heir, you know, he's, yeah. he can mix a record like a Jim Boyer record. And we feel like it has, you know, it deserves to be done by somebody who has that touch. So you think I they'll do like a that... remix of it? Like they did for the Yankee stadium with an actual audio remix because yeah, they've got, they've got the multi-tracks. Um, okay, good. You know, it's reels yeah. of two inch tape, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's all there. I yeah. think it's going to be remixed from the ground up. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It'll be fascinating. It will be. Yeah. Long from out Long Island, yeah, definitely would be fascinating to re-release that. Yes. And probably a lot of songs that weren't even in the original special. I remember making a big evening out of that when they premiered it, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it was very. If you remember Italian restaurant, it was like they did like a little staging of it. I, I was, it was just a much different kind of performance, mm -hmm. and yeah, definitely, it's going to be very special when they re-release it. I'll be curious yeah. if they if this isn't too in the in the weeds, but I'll be curious, Bob, if they keep it in the original four three, or if they'll try to do some creative yeah. pushing on the original VHS tape to kind of give it the sixteen by nine look. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes it, that's uh, hit or okay. miss. If you do it the wrong yeah. way, it could right. If it's if it's shot in four by three, you're going to get those black bars on each side, or you could put mm -hmm. it over itself in right the background. Mm -hmm. Some people say that's very distracting. So they say, hey, get rid of the wings. Well, what does that mean? Get rid of the yeah. wings. So you blow it up, but then you're going to miss some of the screen. You're going to miss some objects on the screen. Yeah. So it will be interesting. I've seen it where they could successfully bring it up, and that's probably stuff that's way out of uh, what I own here. But yeah. uh, it could be possible that they can correctly take it up to 16.9 and, yeah. and make it full. I hope Two quick things I mean, I on that so one. Many old I watch so many old movies. I'm so used to seeing the square sometimes that yeah. I'd rather that. I mean, what are we going to get back into like pan and scan from like, you know, the late nineties? Right. Oh God, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> that was the worst. Right. Mo Dated movies made you way. dizzy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially when you knew the movie well. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. That, that wasn't yep. the camera move. Like, <laughs> And people bitched about letterbox. It's like, you don't know what you're missing, man. <laughs> yep. Quick thing you'll appreciate on live from Long Island uh, before we move on to, uh, you're talking about the Russian album. This was the infamous set of shows where, you know, Billy is yelling, stop lighting the audience because the crowd was lit too much for his liking. And he goes and flips a keyboard, smashes a microphone stand and kind of has the rock and roll moment. Well, Steve Cohen tells us, he's like, yeah, my struggle with Billy on lighting the audience goes back to this show in 1982. He's like, Billy always hated the audience lit. He's like, but when you're filming it, it looks like you're without the audience lit. It looks like you're in a cavern and nobody knows where you are, so especially back then when, you know, concert lighting was a little more rudimentary. And he said, you know, so we had to light the audience to a degree. And he's like, we always he always fought it with us, always fought it with us. And he said, uh, on this show particularly, we were getting a lot of glare on Billy's piano. And unbeknownst to Billy, we decided to spray paint the tops of his two pianos, a matte finish, so there would be no camera, you know, glare from the lights. And he's like, well, Billy back then used to jump on the piano and slide around like during Big Shot and Only the Good Die Young and all these songs. <laughs> Billy didn't know that they did it. So during a rehearsal, during soundcheck something, he goes to hop up and he's like, the slide is gone. He's he, he's like he's stuck. Oh my god! And he they said he was so pissed. <laughs> it was like oh he's god. like he was not happy about that. He's like, but hey, he's like, but hey, doesn't it look cool? I'm like, yeah, it does look cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good spot to pivot. Now that we were talking about the four three and pan and scan and ed editing video, um, to go back talking a little bit of podcast shop. 
Um, and uh, I guess starting with uh, Stephanie, especially because we, you know, we I think we dropped off just talking about you coming into audio and video editing new um when you guys are put when when you and stephanie are putting your show together um are you got are you doing a lot of editing or is it mostly live and if it's live what's your pre-production like and can you please tell us because i'm sick of being up to two in the morning trying to chat my own <laughs> stuttering down to coherence <laughs> Sorry. yeah yeah we actually we do quite a bit of editing um we try to keep things as tight as we can and we always say too that part of it is uh just making sure that we are being um really interesting to others it was like we don't, we don't want to make this sound like a phone call it's going to be boring so we try to keep it to about a tight 30. so we smooth a little bit of the narrative we smooth if we're going off a little bit and then depending on how ambitious I feel, I try to remove some ums and pauses as best we can, but depends mm. on the bandwidth that I have, uh, especially at the end of a work day if I'm trying to get things out the door. Um, but we work from notes. We have um, kind of points that we're going on. It's not a script per se, but we do follow an outline keep ourselves uh, in the areas that we want to talk about. And that has helped us a lot, just getting that, uh, getting that together pre-show. That will help us a lot um, when it comes to the editing that we do. And, um, and it's worked out. Folks have actually said, it's like, oh, I appreciate it. There's like a tightness here. I was like, okay, cool. That was intentional. I was like, I'm glad I took out this area where we kind of went on a tangent that just didn't mm -hmm. take us back, you know, <laughs> that type of yeah. thing. It's like, we want to, we want people to stay listening to the episode, please. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how we approached it over the course of these last couple of years. How far Did ahead you, of release do you record? Is it pretty close or do you give yourself some lead time? We try to do, we try to keep a couple weeks um, just because there's so much unforeseen things that end up happening or in some cases, special episodes that we wanted to do. Um, Vicente Fernandez, when he passed last year too, kind of ended up doing a special episode in the middle of that. Um, so we do try to uh, keep it about two weeks out. But um, yeah, we're every other week for now and until we um, you know, quit our day jobs, I think we're probably going to be every other week for a while. And we're happy with that. We're happy with that. That's good. Because you, um, that's Go ahead, Jack. So, yeah, yeah, but I, I meant to say too, Feel free to like interject. I think there's delay on on Zencaster, so there's a lot of missed opportunities, or at least on my end. Um, yeah. So so getting into, it, I was just just curious. Did you um, did you and Stephanie like look up any any techniques, or did you did you both kind of teach yourselves what you were doing? You know how to set it up and and go at it. We yeah did a little bit of a, a hybrid of both of those things. We wanted to make sure we were recording just with best practices and approaching that in the right way. Equipment wise, wanted to make sure we were doing industry standard. We're part of the Pantheon Music Podcast Network too. Um, so they had uh, helped us too, just in terms of uh, getting us decent mics, um, making sure we had that, which has been really nice because we are also, um, as I think most co-hosts across the country from each other. Um, so even having, you know, mm -hmm. same equipment, makes things of course so much easier in editing and all of that. Um, but it's been nice. I've even had, you know, folks come to me to say, Hey, can you edit um, my podcast if you have time, that type of thing. So I feel like all these skill sets have kind of come together for us and um, helped in a larger way. So it's been nice. Yeah. And you said you work in digital marketing or marketing. I could. Yeah. I'm in digital communications uh, for a philanthropic foundation. Okay. Because you said best practices, I'm like, yep, that's that's a marketing phrase. That's we use that a lot. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um now Bob, you were I you've mostly been behind the scenes, right? Is this pretty much your first time being a host and, and being Oh absolutely, you know, yeah. 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 The only thing I did basically that came close to being on camera uh with CNN is sometimes I do uh voice translations. Okay. The, we get stuff from all over the world. Got to translate. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for ages. Oh no! Ages. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, this is the first time. Yeah, I really enjoy getting on. And again, I, this is good for producing and learning mm -hmm. how to do research and coming up with questions and doing conversation. And 
uh, also for my writing. I did a lot of uh, freelance writing as well. And it's funny because you mentioned, uh, Brian mentioned uh, Huey Lewis. I interviewed him years ago uh, for a newspaper feature I did on him and met him backstage too. Uh, so I, I, it's great and it uh, makes me uh, definitely a better producer and researcher and writer. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, confluence of skills going into this and it's, it's fun because it's so it's, it's still a pretty new medium that we're all, I think we're all just kind of figuring it out. I would imagine in broadcasting, it's, it's pretty uh, standardized now, you know, I mean, let's see here. Uh, so yeah, Brian, tell us a bit about your production process. How, you know, do you, you know, what's your setup like and how do you go through between what you're doing now and playlist wars? Sure. Uh, well, because I started audio editing back in the 1990s, the first experience I have with audio editing, and I'm sure Bob will be familiar with this, was using reel to reel tape with razor blades. Yep. So when you de um and de ah somebody, as you're taking reel to reel tape and twisting it and going, if you cut the tape in two different spots and taped it together after slicing your finger at least two or three times, and then you would play it back, you'd sometimes get a because you missed a part of a word. So when we went from analog to digital, I sat down for the first time and I said, okay, so here's the um, and I highlighted it and I clicked the delete button and in a millisecond it was gone. And my eyes opened up like, <laughs> this is a whole new world. It was like the angels were singing because no longer did I have to slice my hands open. And digital became the norm very quickly. So as mm -hmm. I continued through radio and into podcasting, I've always been from Dilette into Cool Edit Pro into Adobe Audition and all the different voice editing tools. So for me, my editing depends on how we record. A lot of times with Playlist Wars, we just use Zoom because some of our guests are not professional podcasters. Some of them are just friends of ours. We have sure. more famous guests on the show. We were lucky to have Kevin Baldus of Lit, Rob Felicetti from Bowling for Soup. Obviously, I mentioned Liberty DeVito. To go into a, an app or a recording equipment that's not industry standard, sometimes the guest will, eh, maybe I'm going to cancel. But Zoom, because of the pandemic, became... Everybody knows it. Everybody's right. comfortable with it. Everybody used it for family chatting. Everybody used it for everything. So most places insist we use Zoom now. So I've been just using Zoom because of that reason. I personally prefer a little bit better of sound quality because Zoom does the Zoom compression. But at yeah. the end of the day, I've played it for some colleagues of mine and people that I've trusted through decades of people that I look up to. And they said, look, at the end of the day, you're still compressing the final MP3 down. Most people are going to be listening on Bluetooth headphones or across their car over a Bluetooth connection, which is going to compress it even more. Don't stress about Zoom versus a different competitor, so yeah. to speak. Sure. So for me, my biggest things with editing the shows are, is there good noise cancellation in place? When somebody's not talking, are you hearing the clinking of their glass or... Sometimes if people are mic eaters, which I happen to be, I'm always cognizant of making sure I'm not <gasps> into the microphone right. when I'm not speaking, because that makes it a disaster for the person who has to edit my appearance or myself if I'm editing it. And mm -hmm. then the other thing I like to do is try to make sure the levels are nice and even. So that way, if somebody is on, on a microphone, but somebody is on a laptop, that the audio sounds as clean and as close to comfortable as possible. I remember when we edited Rob Felicetti from Bowling for Soup, he was on his laptop right next to his boiler in his family room. And behind him the entire time was just this fan noise. And I spent a good couple of hours just making sure I eliminated it in a good way. So that way his voice wasn't flanging the entire right, time. Yeah. And that was a that was an effort, but I felt like investing that time in the episode made it better for the people listening. And that's kind of always my benchmark is what when I'm listening to a podcast, what are things that as an audio editor bother me? Let me try right. to remove that. But at the same time, I sometimes have to keep myself in check because I am an audio editor. So some things that bother me won't bother 99% of the population. So at that point, I call my wife in and say, does this bother you? And if she just looks at me and goes, no, why? 
then I know I'm overthinking it and I got to right. check my my professional brain a little bit and not overthink it because believe it or not, and I'm sure Bob is a video editor. Knows, sometimes when you get stuck in a video project and you're working on something, you almost it becomes like writer's block where you get stuck and fixated on something, man, the reds on that are just a little off and it's bothering me. But at the end of the day, when you show it to the next line in command, it never gets brought up, but you kind of become your own worst enemy in that regard. So trying to just put no, out something no that lit pun intended. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I just try to put out something that I feel sounds professional is produced with some care and is put out there with the best intention in mind. I've had some friends who are podcasters and they've sent me shows and one of my buddies sent me an episode and I said to them, please don't put this out. They went to a mall after a movie premiered, put their cell phone down in a crowded mall cafeteria area where all the different places are and sat there for an hour and a half and talked about the movie they just saw. But 90% of the episode you can't hear a word they're saying because people are walking by different conversations i said i apologize dude i love you but this is a garbled mess please don't put this out re-record it i know you were going for like uh quick to get it out but this this is unlistenable and i'm saying that like with 100 percent respect and so that's one thing i try to tell people it's you know that's why what the quality and the production is so important because there are you know, the landscape is littered with podcasts, littered with them. And that's one easy way to click the off button is if the audio isn't happening for whatever reason, you know, you're not going to fight through it just to try and get to something. So that's that, that's like basics that you want to make sure you've got a good handle on that before <laughs> going further. Yeah. And it doesn't take a lot of money. I mean, I'm sitting here with a, a microphone that most people don't need. No. I, I've heard some fantastically brilliantly produced podcasts that are done on a blue snowball microphone that you get at Walmart for twenty nine ninety nine. As long as you know a little bit of stuff to just EQ the thing and kind of set some settings and no proper mic placement, you're going right. to sound fine. And for the most part, acceptable. It's just taking that little bit of effort in the beginning when you're kind of starting to lay that groundwork down to kind of set yourself up for success. And by doing that, putting a little bit of, if you're willing to invest a little bit of money into your project or your show or your craft, it's going to pay dividends when more people listen. And I Mm -hmm. think that's something that a lot of new podcasters kind of overlook at first because they think, oh, all we got to do is use our phone because you could do everything on your iPhone. Yes, you can. And I've actually heard some podcasts where people use iPhones. I've seen live takes at concert festivals where people are doing interviews holding their right. iPhone up to people mm-hmm. as a kind of faux microphone. And I've actually mm-hmm. heard through post-production some fairly mind-blowing results, but that's not every instance. So right. as long as you take the time to kind of focus on putting out a good product, I th- I think that as long as that intention is there, usually um, you don't have to go too crazy and go too overboard with, thousands of processors and microphones and stuff for at least for for this level of podcasting because at the end of the day sometimes content is king but sometimes production really means a lot so it all depends Mm -hmm. on the type of show you're doing certainly and do you do you record well in advance as well or is it pretty close to as you release things i am very much a well in advance person i like to have a three to four week buffer if possible and that mm-hmm. was always our goal with Playlist Wars. And that's that's my goal now with my weekly mixtape because I'm kind of setting myself up for failure because the word weekly is in the show. So as long <laughs> as I give myself... So at the time of this recording, I am currently recording episodes that are launching at the time that this episode launches. So mm-hmm. that way I have that buffer. So when life happens and family situations arrive and work situations arrive i got a buffer zone where i can miss two weeks but still have two weeks to catch back up and right. and to me that buffer is huge to be able to do it consistently and that's that's helped jack and i as well too we we are big proponents of what we call chunking it where we'll uh see like all right can we do two or three tonight <laughs> and we go yeah. we, we go long you know, we'll we'll have an hour episode that is truncated from an hour and fifty minute conversation sometimes. Um, 
And so we will often try to do batch recording where we'll do two a night. We're actually doing another one tonight after this. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Uh, West Coast over there is, is just fine with that, isn't he? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Jack's like, dude, it's two in the morning. I got it. I'm, I'm falling yeah, asleep I'm a night over owl, here. So it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> it works. It works well yeah, for yeah. us. But yeah, we're so recording an episode about 1989 later tonight. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it, it really helps us. Um, and we, we like to have a reserve. Same reason. Because life yeah. gets chaotic and with him and I both having busy lives outside of the very busy podcast, we let, we, we always want to maintain our, we're every two weeks as well. We always want to maintain that every other, and I don't know if you ever caught it. Ours come out on Tuesdays, which is, we, we like to kind of be in line with the old music release schedule every, every Tuesday. Um, and so, so yeah, we like to have a few in the, in the tank that way, if something gets a little crazier, we have to cancel. We're, uh, we're going to be okay. So we'll go from everybody doing a whole bunch of editing to the Jack Kerouac of our group, which is Bob Neville, who yes. just, just lays it all out there. And it, <laughs> it works really well. I've been uh, catching up on some of yours. And um, how is it riding that wave, knowing that you're not going to do a lot of editing and, and getting some good content out of somebody pretty much in one take? Yeah, it's it's pretty much all in the research and knowing that you've got enough content there and get the people to fluently talk. I don't have a time limit or anything like that. It's just like, let's just do this and let it free flow. Unless I have like huge gaps in there or anything like that, I'll put the episode through. I mean, I'm used to Premiere Pro, so mm -hmm. that's really, and I can do an audio and a vi video version of it. So I'm also on YouTube as well. Uh, so if I want to, you know, cut the length, I can do that. But uh, yeah, I, for for the most part, if I feel like it's really, really dragging, I'll do some serious editing to it. But most episodes, I could go from start to finish. And I've had really great guests that really keep the flow going. So I don't feel like I need to really take very much out of there. I probably average maybe 35, 45 minutes. Uh, some go a little bit longer like our episode did. Uh, yeah, but we were a little passionate there. <laughs> I love that. You know, some people were like, "Why don't you just chop that in half?" I'm like, "I'm not doing. It. I'm no, no. It's like it's going out as its own episode." So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I I don't like to do very much to it. Uh, but sometimes I'll get that. Um, I'll get the mojo to do and, and dress it up and promote that a little bit more on YouTube. And mm -hmm. if I'm going to put some content in there, uh, the people are speaking to. Uh, I think my third episode, I did an interview with uh, an artist and I use some of their music videos. So I, I'll do it whenever I, I have the energy to do that. But for the most part, it's nice to basically go in, out. If I want to do some fonts, I'll do that uh, and do the audio and the video version and, and just get those out there. Uh, I have yeah. played around a little bit with uh, audition which i really enjoy mm -hmm. that's that's a mm -hmm. really great program uh if we have some really bad audio i definitely can work with that and uh great great program i don't have pro tools that's a little bit more out of my league it's i, I probably have to hire somebody to, to to work with pro tools with me audition was a game changer because i do a lot of the well a lot of the splicing i would say is it falls on me and i was using um the heck is a free one called audacity, audacity. Yep. for a while he had and the it, was like it was working, but like, you know, you wanted to make those, those splices. And I used to, uh, I used to save up a uh -huh's from, I used to cut them out and then I used to put them on different tracks to hide the splices. Cause I couldn't, cause it was just too much to try to do a crossfade. And then I finally go to audition. I'm like, you mean I just have to drag it a half an inch and it makes the little, you know, yellow, uh, ye yellow <laughs> X of destiny. I'm like, this is fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, audacity yeah. sometimes makes you wish for the old razor blades with the reel to reel machine because right. <laughs> yeah. I did that yeah. razor blading in college. Uh, Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See but now my experience with digital was so different because I went to film school and I started in nineteen ninety nine. So I actually never uh edited film. I shot on film a little, but never had to never had to do the razor blade. But um holy shit <laughs> were, were those computers <laughs> slow and it was like yeah, oh, yeah, it was the worst experience of my life. I would have rather like broken open an artery by accident than have to use. I still have like <laughs> shutters thinking about like sitting there and you're in the zone and then it freezes and you're like, no, no, no. Blue screen, <laughs> last three hours of your life may have well never happened. 
Yeah. I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, right. I actually went to, went to school for music production, but it was in the late nineties, early two thousands. So we, we had like one course on pro tools, but you know, we also learned to calibrate tape machines and, you know, razor blade editing and, Yep. So we, a lot of our work was on two inch 24 track, um, in school. So I, uh, it was just a lot of trial and error for, for me just getting familiar with it. And I'm a musician. So I was always, you know, playing in bands and had a hand in the production whenever we would record or make records. So it just was always part of what I was into. Uh, but Jack and I, we have an interesting, um, working relationship and, I'm so grateful that I've got a partner that shares a lot of the, the load um, because we, we do a pretty good tag team when it comes to our, our episodes. So we'll, you know, we'll record like this, our, our separate tracks and he will, um, Jack will send over his file. I'll take it in. I'll get us synced up together. I'll do the initial audio treatment. So I'll get levels and check, remove, you know, I'll do some, noise gates just to get rid of some of the little background noise. I'll clean some things up and get everything nice and tight. And then I'll, I'll ship it back to him. Jack will take my files that I've cleaned up and he does the big conversation edit where he will take, and Jack's got a journalism background. So he's got a great knack for shaping a story. Um, and so he will take our big conversation and whittle it down to the really good nuts and bolts. And so he will get that all together He'll then send it back to me. I'll do another pass and just pick out a few small things that, um, you know, if need a little cleaning up or that I want to take out. Uh, so we'll just, I'll do one more little refinement. Then I'll bring that in and I'm the one who assembles it and adds the music, the interview clips and does the overall final mix. So between him and I, we're, we're pretty much passing things back and forth throughout the process. That's awesome. And it's, and it's funny. I was just thinking last. I was telling my girlfriend, "It this is this is unheard. This would have been unheard of twenty twenty five years ago." I was laying in bed editing because I was I was trying to get something done. I was like, I didn't want to have another night where you know, she's asleep and I'm just tinkering away upstairs somewhere and sneaking down. So it, I was just laying there with my laptop and I get I got so tired. I started to dream in the middle of it, and I don't know how I didn't make a bad cut because it was like, okay. Uh, no, we got to take that out because the taxi's coming in and we got to, no, 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 wait, that, that has nothing to do with anything. I got to get this done now. <laughs> was that the one that you, we just did this week, Jack? Yeah. Yeah. I, when I was like, I'll write the intro tomorrow. I'm, I'm falling asleep. Like you were texting me. I'm like, nope, this is, I'll respond in eight hours. Well, six knowing me, but you know. <laughs> Your edit was great. Like literally I, I cleaned up two flubs of mine. Otherwise your edit was really solid. So you'd never oh. know that you were like... <laughs> So out of I, we fun. figured it out. This is the secret to editing that <laughs> end of the day. All right. Um, yeah, let's uh, start bringing this home. Clearly we're going to do some chopping here, but this has been great. Um, all right, let's do uh, one more round, kind of go through um, everybody's highlights, what you have in store, things like that. Um, all right. So, uh, and uh, yeah, so this has been great. And uh, back around um, so just to kind of zoom it out and talking about our projects in general, uh, I guess we'll start with Stephanie again. Um, what have been some of the highlights of the podcast so far? And uh, what do you have in store for this year? Yeah, yeah. When I think about um, highlights from so far, um, I like kind of when we departed a little bit from our usual format. Um, I really liked the collective Valentine's Day episode we did last year. We invited on some of our fave podcasts, including this one. Uh, to tell their stories connected to the music and folks really seemed to like that. And I loved hearing from people. So that was such a cool uh, community vibe and I really enjoyed that. And that was definitely a highlight. And then um, folks had told us they really enjoyed our uh, two-parter Elvis episode that we did this past year. We released that ahead of the movie before it came out. So uh, nobody had seen it. It had, was not released in theaters yet. So we, um, did a little speculation on what we thought we might see. And we were, we were pretty, uh, we're pretty dead on. So anyway, folks said they enjoyed that. So that was a real highlight and I really enjoyed that. Um, as for what we have in store this year, we're excited to have some upcoming nineties focused episodes that we're pretty excited about, including some really great concert stories and fun times that we've had there. And, uh, 
I think, I don't know, we've noticed folks tend to love the 90s as much as we do. So uh, fun to do a little nostalgic look back. And then, you know, since our show is so focused on Stephanie and I's joint memories, we're actively planning on ways this year to create some more music memories with each other. So we can share that on the show, including planning some concerts together. We're going to probably go to some festivals, um, you know, music themed field trip or two um, to help Mm -hmm. inform the show. So excited about that to get together. IRL, as the kids say. Yeah, Jack and I, I Uh, think uh, we've, we've seen each other. We've been in the same room once. So far, ever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, twice. So, uh, no, I came out to uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, you're right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Jack and his girlfriend came to Washington. That was a quick one, though. We, Washington. Yeah. Well, so was so was uh, New York. I was in New York for about 14 hours. Yeah. Um, but we, uh, yeah, so we, we're uh, we're planning on getting together nec- uh, in March. We're going to both fly to LA. Um, Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks are doing a big run of shows this year. So we're going to we're going to go see the opening night. Nice. All right. Look me up when you're in LA, guys. Yeah, we'd love to see you. Ah. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah, we should do that. Um, quick story. It was when I went out um, to Washington. We go out to see my girlfriend's uh, sister. So I, you know, made you know made a trip down, and Michael and I were hanging out. We went to a couple of record stores, and I had asked them if they had a certain record. And the woman was like, "I, I think we have it at home. I'll have it. In, I can bring it in tomorrow." I said, "No, no, it's it's fine. I appreciate it, but I'm flying back to Philadelphia tomorrow morning, so you know I won't be able to get it." And, uh, and this is such a missed opportunity. I don't know why we didn't do this, but then Michael found concert, you know, the, the, the double album on record there. I said, well, I have to buy it now. So I bring it up to the counter. The woman goes, you came all the way from Philadelphia just to buy a Billy Joel record. And I'm like, are we going to get into this conversation? Are we going to do it? Like, <laughs> yeah, we, it. We, we just ended up letting the moment slide by, but it would have yeah. been an interesting I wanted to, I would say we should have taken a picture outside and then published it on the on our Facebook page and tagged the record store. So we're like, right. look what we found and just let them figure it out. <laughs> awesome. How about you, Bob? What would have been some highlights for you? And uh, what do you have in store for this year? I had some really nice highlights. Uh, ben Barnes from Westworld. Uh, I had on, oh, it seemed like a year and a half ago. Uh, he got into music. So some of these people are like, you know, actors getting into music. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. I got to speak with a guy named John Coco, who does movie trailers. Um, and I got to meet uh, some really, really interesting people through this. Uh, Dinah Manoff, who was on the uh, television show Soap. She did, uh, she wrote a book. And, uh, just a lot of guests. I have some interesting guests coming up. Uh, I had a guy, actually, this is not really music related so much, but he worked in Ukraine and he was talking about the war. So I'm using some of my journalism experience there as a future episode. Uh, right now I have a guy from a band called Royal Sugar, just released that uh, band out of Florida. So the really, really nice stuff, uh, that's coming out of there. And a guy named Mr. Hub, who's a rapper. I've had a few rappers on this. Uh, some of these PR people are coming at me with, uh, these very interesting guests. So that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Uh, Mr. Hub is based in uh, New Jersey. He does mm-hmm. rap and a lot of community service. Uh, so it's a little balance of both of those. So, uh, Plan on a lot more music guests and uh, it's just expanding beyond that and having a whole wide variety of people who've uh, been from all walks of life. Um, I th- you know, it's so cool uh, to have this outlet because I remember when I was doing, uh, I was working for a couple of magazines and more people would reach out to you than you could ever fit on the pages, you know, let alone if it was, if I was able to make the call. So it's, it's, it's a great idea to just start a podcast and be like, oh, bring them on. It's a great way to, to um I have to imagine it's a great way to keep those contacts fresh all the time too and keep those channels of communication open. Yeah, it really snowball, snowballs. And I yeah. really enjoy having people from, you know, from bands like that. A guy uh, from Styx, a keyboardist I mm-hmm. had a great interview oh, with. Yeah. Who just yeah. retired. Yeah. And uh, Collective Soul, which is a very big band here. Collective Soul mm-hmm. uh, came mm-hmm. out with a, another album. They're still creating. So opposite from Billy, who's got yeah. out of the pop world i didn't know they were still coming out i'm gonna have to check that out now yeah yeah yep. really good yeah. stuff collective soul i mean they're still writing really good material their collective souls last three or four albums have been fantastic i had the good fortune on Tude styles to interview will turpin 
uh, from from the band. And he's such an amazing guy. We had such a fantastic conversation with him. And uh, just kind of hearing the stories behind some of the songs gives you a newfound appreciation because I feel like their hits kind of pigeonholed them as one type of band. But right. they are very eclectic. And I think when you listen to their albums as entities, you gain a newfound respect for the fact that they're willing to try a lot of different things musically that maybe night might not seem like their collective soul, but they all work. And the band is ridiculously talented. Hmm. Yeah, I talked to Dean Rowland twice. Oh, nice. Oh, did nice. you talk to Dean? Dean. Nice. Hell yeah. of a drummer. He is, he's incredible. Yeah. Hmm. Really, really cool you know, guy. I don't get them on the road though. So I, those are phoners. So not everything mm-hmm. uh, is over zoom. Some mm-hmm. of those are like 20 minute phoners and I'll mm-hmm. pat out that episode. I'll do some editing there and yeah. uh, do a little reminiscing over that, but uh, great live band. Wow. Yeah. And, and stick still sounds pretty good. We'll never be in the rock and roll hall of fame. Right. <laughs> you know, they're, they're kind of that mid-level act, you know, like sticks, foreigner, lover boy, all those guys. It's like, they don't get that respect. Not on Billy's level. Well, well then yeah. sticks was also flirting with prog rock, which, which never makes it in. So, Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless you're Rush, but that was deservedly yeah. so. Yeah, Rush is the outlier there. Every year, Jethro Tull fans just start on, you're like, do you, and whatever. And the sun's hot. Like, what else? What did you think was going to happen? Like, <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, yeah. the, you know, my world, you know, growing up in as a loving metal in the late 80s and 90s, there was the famed story about Jethro Tull winning the very first Best Heavy Metal Grammy Award. Yeah. Versus they were against Justice Motorhead, Soundgarden, oh, Metallica, <laughs> ACDC. And they didn't even show up. <laughs> no. Yeah, right Metallica. after Metallica performed one, well, they go and give it to Jethro right. Tull. Jethro <laughs> Tull. I was, funny well, I, was, I was mortified. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm sitting there holding my Justice for All album. <laughs> like, yes, they're going to. And then they lost. I'm like, who the hell is Jethro Tull? Although my right. father pulled me aside and gave me Aqualung. So yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, they're actually not that it's, bad, but they shouldn't right. have beat Metallica. <laughs> not metal. Well, it's funny, you know, because when they finally won for the Black Album two, three years later, the first thing Lars Ulrich says, he's like, well, first of all, we have to thank Jethro Tull <laughs> for not putting Tull. out an album this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, a friend of mine came up with a theory that it was sort of a backdoor way to give Led Zeppelin a Grammy because Tull and, and Zeppelin kind of came up at the same time. And at least, you know, around the time of uh, Aqualung and, and I guess Stand Up, they were both sort of traveling in the same genre, you know, a little bit of riffy metal, some mysticism, things like that. So he thought like, now that they have a heavy metal Grammy, they had to give it to Tull because they could never give it to, to Zeppelin. That's what he <laughs> came up with. I accept it. I, th- I like it. It's an interesting <laughs> theory. I actually really like that right? one. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, Brian, um, reaching through your long and storied career in broadcasting and podcasting, what are uh, some highlights from your podcasting? And uh, tell us about a little more about the show that's launching uh, the week that we're recording this. Well, right now, yeah, the week that this show gets released, my new show is going to be available. It's called My Weekly Mixtape. And I guess the launch of the show would be the highlight. Um, and I'm hoping Mm -hmm. to keep this one running for a long time. This is the first show that I'm doing by myself as the sole host, no co-host. I'm going to have a guest on each week. And like I said, we are going to craft a mixtape each week based on a topic, theme, band, or genre. And what we're going to do is craft it like I did when I was a kid. The guest will choose a song and then I will look at that song and say, what would I follow that song up with? And we'll each mm-hmm. bring a bank of songs that we feel we want to talk about, but it's going to be very spontaneous. We're going to build it on the fly and discuss our reasonings between why we're following up a song with the pick that we're going to make and why we hope they'll follow it up with something else and kind of try to mm-hmm. coerce each other into picking songs that we like to try to build something that would be a conversation. Basically each episode is going to be a musical conversation between myself and the guest and the mixtape will play out as how our music kind of bounces off each other. So I'm hoping Mm -hmm. that it creates a lot of fun conversations around the songs. And I'm hoping that people will get that feeling for putting some effort into crafting a mixtape around emotions and around feelings more than just a collective playlist of dragging songs in when you hear a new song, just kind of tacking Mm -hmm. one on the end, really putting some thought and kind of effort into the magic of 
creating a mixtape with somebody. And I know that sounds really silly, but my buddies and I did it growing up and it's just something I hold so near and dear to my heart. Why shouldn't we be doing it now? And that's kind of what my weekly mixtape's all about. If you're interested in learning more, it's myweeklymixtape.com. And I'm on all the social channels under my weekly mixtape. I would love to connect with other people. And honestly, the reason for me that I do podcasting is to have conversations with people. So it has been an absolute honor to talk with you, Michael, Jack, Stephanie, Bob. I think you guys all have incredible products. And I am very thankful to be able to share this space with you all and have these conversations with you. It means the world to me because anybody who knows me for more than 10 seconds knows that I'm always going to try to spin the conversation to music and to have four other people willing to sit and have this conversation with me tonight. It just makes me, it, it makes my heart happy. So thank you guys for what you do. And I appreciate all your shows and thank you so much for keeping this conversation going in podcasting because uh, I'm just honored to be a part of this circle with you guys. Well, thank you, uh, Brian, so much for coming on and, and uh, to Stephanie and Bob, I feel like that's a, uh... Brian, uh, Stephanie, Bob, thank you all so much for coming on. Uh, I had a great time uh, speaking with you all. Um, it's a lot of fun, you know, actually speaking with other people doing the same thing and, you know, seeing where uh, seeing where we're the same, seeing who's doing what differently and and just getting to collaborate. You know, it's podcasting is great and we're all having conversations, but, you know, we all end up in our little silos. So it's, it's great to to speak with new people and, and just have that interaction. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, as, you know, someone who is a music fan like you all, I've always been someone who loves kind of, you know, peering behind the glass and seeing how the sausage is made and how the magic comes together. So to have some of our favorite podcast hosts on with us to learn about your craft and how you guys put your shows together, it's a real treat to get an inside look at your processes. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been great talking with all of you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. It's been fantastic. Um, so you can find us at uh, stephaniestalktunes.com and any uh, platform that you're on, anywhere you'd like to get your podcasts. And then we're on all the socials at uh, Stephanie's Talk Tunes. That's Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. And then we're just Stephanie's Talk on Twitter. And if somebody really wants to talk to us, it's stephaniestalktunes at gmail.com if you want to say hi directly. And my website is talesfromthecorners.com. And I'm also at TFTC with, and my name is spelled out B-O-B-N-E-B-E-L. And that's on all the major platforms, especially I like Apple Podcasts the most. Uh, that's where I get most of my stats. Fantastic. Great. And uh, Stephanie has broached TikTok. We've been... We've been joking that we're never on there, so I'm going to have to figure this out now, too. <laughs> a little bit a long way over there, which is kind of nice. Okay. Yeah, I've heard. About, I've heard, yeah. About a year or so ago, there was a, a trend with a Billy Joel song on there. And so half-jokingly, we, we brought Jack's 18-year-old daughter on, uh, and we had this little segment we called Ask a Young Person, <laughs> uh, where we <laughs> had Please uh, explain this TikTok, talk you know. It. Yeah, because everybody on the on the Billy Joel boards are like, "What the hell is this TikTok thing? Why is it only twenty seconds of the song? Why is people giving the finger during it?" I'm like, "All right, we'll we'll help you out a little. Let's unpack this a little bit." Yeah. 